morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to have you here at the Cold Springs Church of Christ Bible Study this morning, welcoming those who are here in person and those with us online. Testing? Is that too loud? Testing? I think that's about right. <clears throat> Anywho, good morning. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to have you here and to close with you in person and those of you online. <clears throat> I would ask at this time that you please silence your cell phones if you don't want any distractions. First song will be hymn number 381. 381. <clears throat> Shall we sing? I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to his hands, till the decisive hour. Then will he own my worthless name? like to say good morning to everyone. And as I look over the audience this morning, Brother Hancock, we only need 45 more people to have that 60 in the back. I just believe the Bible tells us, ask and it shall be, so let us pray. Father, at this time, we thank you for all the blessing you've showered upon us. Life itself, the joy of being members of your church, being able to assemble here, here and to greet one another again. We thank you for your word that teaches us how to live at this present time to prepare ourselves to meet you. We thank you for your son that you sent into this world and made it possible that all mankind can have eternal life. Bless those that are listening and lying. And Father, at this time, we pray for all of our members, but especially Sister Bertha at this time. Be with Noel and that family as well. Be with Brother Mark, he shall teach this class and allow our heart to receive the graphic word that is able to save our soul. And Father, when it is all said and done, we pray that you forgive us of all of our sins and receive us in that day as one of yours. It's in Jesus' name we offer this prayer. Amen. Thank you, Joe and George. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Have you with us in person and online? According to Joe, we're going to have a crowd rush in here in a minute, right? Get to that 69 for class. So y'all prepare yourselves so you won't go into shot. Arlene, you ready? Okay, you got to be ready to greet. Everybody comes in. Well. Regardless of the numbers, a few or a lot, we're glad to have you. We, do, we are online, and we do have a lot of people with us, sometimes from other places in the world, so we're glad to have you with us, whether you're near or far. Of course, today is 9-11, kind of a sobering day for many of us as we reflect on what happened 21 years ago, and I have a connection to make during the message today with that, but again, just to recognize again, I know for some of you that was very traumatic. Uh, some of you have heard my story that I was living in Japan at the time and came over for a funeral and was flying through New York when it happened, and I was in North Carolina actually and headed towards New York when it happened, and I got grounded and had to stay another week to 10 days, and then when I got to New York, all the airport was boarded up. They didn't allow you to, they had almost like a maze 
you were forced to walk through the airport to a particular area. And in my case, my flight to Japan got delayed also, so I had to spend the night. And there weren't, they weren't allowing you to leave the airport. But there was a Red Cross area, and they allowed us to sleep there. So being in Japan, you know, for the funeral, I had several bags and everything like you would when you travel overseas. And I didn't know what to do with them because they wouldn't allow us to put them in lockers, you know, or secure them anywhere. So I had to sleep with my bag. So I was laying on a Red Cross cot, and I had one leg over one large bag and one leg over the other large bag. I had my overnight, uh, you know, my carry-on bag on top of my chest, and that's how I slept a few hours before I got on the plane. But a very nerve-wracking time for many of you here, too, that were stateside, I'm sure. Who's that, Shirley? Oh, really? They were in New York? Oh, the week before it happened. They had been there the week before it actually came crashing down. Anyway, I'm sure each of you have your own individual uh, remembrance of that, perhaps. We want to continue to pray for our world as it often is at war, uh, obviously in the spiritual war, but there's also a physical war that seems to go on, and unfortunately it some of us get caught with the shrapnel flying around it. So praying for peace is a good thing for us to continue. So anyway, 9-11 we do want to remember and soberly take some lessons perhaps from that. But into today's lesson, if you don't mind, as we get back into roles in the family of God, roles in the family of God. And we have over the past several weeks, and now I think it's actually been several months, hasn't it? We have taking our time, but we have worked starting back in Genesis, everybody, in case you're with us for the first time. We divided up, if you will, the time periods that are presented in the Bible into three periods. There are many ways to do this. This is just one helpful way. Many people call the, the time before Moses the patriarchal period, when God spoke to the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this patriarchal period, we were looking for signs of how God wanted roles to play out in two areas in our world, that is in the church and in the family. Each week I remind you we're not talking about politics, uh, we're not talking about businesses, we're talking about only two institutions that are in our world, is church and the family. So as we looked in the patriarchal period, we noticed there was a pattern. God created Adam first, and then from Adam's rib, he created Eve. Eve was called a helpmate, and she was created to support and enable Adam to do the task that God had called him to. They were both equal in God's sight because they were both made in God's image. So the value of them is established from the very beginning, even though their roles were somewhat different. Yes. So we walked ourselves through this patriarchal period. We came to about Genesis chapter 12, we came across another very important person we call Abraham. Sometimes he's called the father of the Jews. It was here that God made four promises to Abraham. One of those is that through his family, the Messiah would be coming into the world. We'll be getting back to that promise in just a few moments as we review. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a couple of sons, Jacob and Esau, but the more famous one is Jacob. We notice that in the Bible, God is called the father of or the, excuse me, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we noticed that as God was working with this structure, Abraham had a very faithful wife, right? Her name was, everybody help me out, Sarah. Isaac's faithful wife was Rebecca. Jacob had a couple of wives, but the one we refer to the most is Rachel, right? So Rachel, we have three very important women. Interesting, though. God is never called the God of Rebecca and Rachel. So we ask the obvious question. Is God misogynistic? Does God not care for women? Well, we go back to, again, Genesis chapter 1, and we're told that both male and female were made in God's image. So we understand that they had equal value. So if God wasn't indicating a lesser value because he doesn't call himself the God of Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, what is he saying? Well, he's not saying that they're less important. He's simply saying that in the roles that he brought into 
his society of the talking about the church and the family, was church use, uh, loosely used at this time, his spiritual community. He had a role for these three men, and that was to provide leadership. That did not mean that Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel were not important or that they did not have equal value, but they had different roles. And so we looked and we studied during this patriarchal time, and we found that pattern often repeated. That God established roles for men and women back here. We reference one more just to go back to one of the consequences of Eve when she ate of the fruit first. We notice that when God came down into the Garden of Eden, who did God speak to first, even though Eve ate the fruit first? Spoke to Adam, which we thought was kind of a little bit strange. I mean, obviously, if you're going to hold somebody accountable, you usually go to the person that it started. So the sin started with Eve. Adam is equally culpable. Don't get me wrong here. But Eve was the one that ate the fruit first. So why didn't God go to Eve first? Again, reading minds a little bit. We understand that God came to Adam because he was ultimately holding Adam responsible for his leadership in that family. And he didn't appropriately do it. But that didn't change the fact that God called him out on it. So we see as God hands out consequences, even though Eve ate the fruit first, And you might say in some ways she provided leadership, right? Because how did Adam get the fruit in the first place? She gave it to him. So you might say looking at that from the outside in, hey, it almost appears as if Eve's the one leading at least this decision making. But when God hands out consequences, he doesn't ask Adam to answer to Eve. He asks Eve to be in subjection to Adam. So we understood that regardless of the sin and regardless of the position Eve had and how that played out, God made it very clear that he had wanted Adam to provide leadership and one of the consequences, because this didn't play out the way he wanted, he made it even clearer when he said one of the consequences of Eve is that she would be in subjection to her husband. We then moved into the Mosaical period. This usually starts with about the Ten Commandments, the time of Moses who brings it in. That's why we call it Mosaical And we looked in several areas. This is where we spent most of our time the last few weeks, actually, right? There are leaders like Moses. What is his brother and sister's name, everybody? Miriam and Aaron. We also have priests at this time. We have judges. We have prophets. We have kings. And we noticed that there was a pattern there that was similar to what was back in the patriarchal period. First of all, with Let's just work our way through here. With priests, who, who qualified to be a priest, everyone? Let's start with the tribe. What tribe was a priest? Tribe of Levi. How many other tribes were there? There were 11 other tribes. So, again, if you use the thought that when God signifies, he must be biased or prejudiced because he doesn't appreciate another group, you'd have to say, well, since God chose the tribe of Levi, to be priests, wasn't God being biased? Wasn't he being prejudiced towards the other 11 tribes? Well, we don't see that, right? They just had a role to play. Did Jesus come through the family of Levi? No, he came through what tribe? Tribe of Judah. So, you know, again, at the very essence here, you know, no one probably has quite put together all of what Jesus Christ is going to be, but we understand by looking at this from the very start, that it appears God, again, has roles that he gets to decide regardless of what human wisdom or intuition might tell them. And we may not always appreciate it. We may not always like it. But God asks us to accept it. And even within his 12 tribes of people, he signified a group for a specific role, and he expected everyone else to accept it. John, do you have something, Dan? He did have one priest in the family of God. Uh-huh. You talk about... Uh, Oh, Melchizedek? Yes, uh, that's true. I hadn't thought of that. So uh, John's reminding us actually back here we have Melchizedek, who Abraham gave 10% of everything where the tithing starts. Thank you for that. So there is a priest that kind of overlaps a little bit. He's a little bit unique, right, in the sense that we don't know his history. He doesn't come from the tribe of Levi because, of course, that hasn't started there. But you've made a good point, John, that there is a priest back here, and even he is a male He is a, again, God could have chosen a woman priest if he had wanted to in a similar way that he told Melchizedek, 
because we don't have any historical record about why Melchizedek was chosen or given the position that he was. He just kind of appears on the scene, and Abraham appreciates him and recognizes that. And there's another evidence again, right, that God chooses whom he wants as he wants as the situation arises. So thank you. That's right. Jesus, in a similar way, uh, doesn't come from, again, the tribe of Levi, for example. So he's unique, much like Melchizedek. And we're going to make that connection up here in just a little bit. So as we work through here, right, we find, again, that the leaders primarily are men. But we came across some exceptions. Let's talk about a few of those. Who were one of the exceptions, let's say, for example, during the time of Judges? Her name was Deborah. We asked some of the obvious questions. You know, God seems to suddenly be making a change in how he's working with his communities because he chooses Deborah. Is that, how we, is that what we figured out? Colby, what, what did we recognize? What is Deborah an example of then? She's an exception to the rule. Again, who makes the exception? God does. There wasn't a man-made exception there. God chose Deborah. Again, we don't know the reason why, but we look at the circumstance, if you remember. She was, she was making judgments for God as she sat under a tree, as the Bible says there. But she was called to go tell a man to lead the people into battle, weren't they? Now, she eventually ended up going with him, but that was only because of what? That's right. He wouldn't go unless she would go with him. But that wasn't God's intention. God's intention was for her, you might say, to hand off that responsibility to a man, even though it didn't necessarily play out that way. So even though Deborah was a mouthpiece, a, an instrument for God to use, he is still wanted the military campaign, at least, led by Barak, who was a little bit timid for whatever reason and needed Deborah to give him back up. But that, again, was an exception to the rule. Well, we get into the time of prophets. And by the way, there were about 13 judges, and out of that, in that book, only Deborah, one, is a woman there. With the prophets, what did we find out here? Did we run across some women prophets during this time period? Great. Good, good point. We talked about that word prophet or prophetess can be a little bit ambiguous in the Old Testament. Ambiguous meaning, it can have more than one meaning. For example, we have Isaiah's wife called a prophetess. Do we have any record of her making a prophecy? We don't. Is it possible she was a prophet? It's possible, but we don't have any example of her being or given any prophecies. So more than likely, she's called that because she's the wife of a prophet. Okay? What's another example of someone during this time period? we found out was a prophet, another woman. That's right, good. It starts with H, it's not Hancock, okay? <laughs> it's Hulda, H-U-L-D-A-H, Hulda, okay? What did we learn about her? What, what was her role, do you remember? What was she called to do? She lived during the time of a king named Josiah. Remember, Josiah's guys were cleaning up the temple, and what did they find? They found this book. What was that book? Basically, it was the Bible, <laughs> the Pentateuch. You know, it had been, been kind of left behind by some other kings, but they came across it, and they said, they took it you know, to Josiah and said, hey, we, we found this book. It's like they didn't even recognize it. And they started looking through it and go, oh, my goodness, look at the words written here. And it had some pretty strong language about prophecies that were going to happen to their country. And so Josiah said, hey, you better go ask the prophetess Huldah about this. And then God sent a message through Hulda that, yes, he was going to punish his people, but because Josiah was a faithful priest and his heart was drawn towards God, he would put it off to a later time. So we know Hulda was a prophet. She was a prophetess, if you will. So we have examples of that. So again, though, out of these 30 prophets or so, and loosely counting, you know, and Samuel kind of overlapping with a couple there, he's kind of like a, a priest also in some ways, only one, again, is pointed out. Again, what does that signify to us? Is God creating a new world order with leadership in his communities because there's one person that stands out from the num numbers of others? 
No, again, as you said, Colby, it's an exception to the general rule, and God does use people as he sees best fit and where he wants, but again, who's making that decision? God is. It's not a man-made decision. Now, let's back up here for a minute and remind ourselves of a situation that happened with Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. What lesson did we learn from the situation when Miriam and Aaron challenged the leadership of Moses. What's that? Don't be jealous. Okay, that's a very practical one. Thank you, Shirley. Don't be jealous. Who paid a price for the jealousy? Right, Miriam did. Everybody remember what happened? They went, they challenged the leadership of Moses. What did God do to Miriam that she had to wait seven days until she was healed? She's given us some kind of skin disease. Some, it's called leprosy. As we know, the word leprosy can be dubious in the Old Testament. Can, remember, can indicate many different types of skin diseases. But regardless of whatever it was, she had to live outside of the camp. And as someone astutely pointed out that I didn't think about this, someone last week or a couple weeks ago said that inconvenienced the whole tribe because they had to wait for her to get well before they could move on, which is a good point, which is a lesson in and of itself, right? When you step outside of the role that God indicates for you, you're not only harming yourself, but many times, at the very least, you can inconvenience or perhaps even harm the community you're within. So again, not picking on women, but we're trying to look at the role that God has given for his people. But because Miriam stepped outside of the role and tried to usurp the authority of a God-appointed leader, she was punished for it. John? That's right. Good point. Amen. That's right. That's right. Thank you for bringing that out, John. He's reminding us that Miriam was also a leader in the community. Who did, he, who did she lead everybody? The women. And what example do, did we look at that covers that? What did she do when the people came to the Red Sea? What was her leadership signified by? She led the women in song and praise to God. And the Bible shows exactly what John's reminding us of is that Miriam had a role within the community. She was important and she had a valuable place and she had, you know, a great deal of importance. But again, when she tried to step outside and take on more responsibility than when God intended, she paid a price for it. But John, your point's well taken. Women are called to teach, older women are called to teach the younger women. Older men are called teach the younger men, and if we all have an important place to play, right, in, the, in what God is trying to commu- uh, create in his community and in his families. All right, we get to kings, right? Again, approximately 39 kings there between Israel and Judah. Are there any women kings? Yeah, there was one, right? What was her name? Anybody remember? Remember? Athalia, that's right, okay? But why did she become a king, basically queen? Did God appoint her? Did she fall in the line of what God intended? No, in fact, to get that role, she killed a large number of her grandchildren to make sure that she could get that role. So even though we admit there was one woman king slash queen at this time, it wasn't because she was godly appointed. It's because she took on the authority of herself And you know what happened to her a few months later? She was executed by some of God's people because of that very thing. So similar, again, to Mary, I'm not quite the same. Again, not picking on women. We're looking at roles, and that's what we need to focus on. Don't focus on gender so much as recognizing that when people fulfill the roles that God gives them, they flourish. When people try to usurp the role or they don't fulfill their responsibility as God intends, they're punished, and many times the community suffers for that. Anyone else before we leave this time period, a patriarchal and mosaical period? All right, so, Greg? Amen. Yeah, Greg wants to remind us that Starla is to be greatly respected for giving birth to their two girls. <laughs> Well, I think that's the same for all of us, man. We all feel that way about our wives. And even if they don't give birth to a child, we still recognize their great value and 
51, talking about the godly woman and her importance in the family, certainly is, a, again, an identification that God recognizes and loves women. Actually, childbirth, Greg, is something I was planning to get to later today, but you're obviously already connecting in to something that naturally flows forth when we look at women we recognize what their value is. But let's be honest. Sometimes in our world and in our society and our families, men don't do a good enough job recognizing and valuing our women. That's, that's part of the problem. That's part of the brokenness of the world we live in. You know, Adam, in a sense, took a back seat to Eve and paid a steep price for it. If he had honored and cherished and protected his wife as God intended, perhaps it, at the very least it would have been a little harder for Satan to come up and tempt Eve. All right? But we need to learn the lesson from Ephesians 5 that we are called, right, as men to love our wives as what? As Christ loves the church and did what? Gave himself for it. So again, we'll keep repeating this theme when we get into this Christian age, but since Greg brought that up, that's something we constantly want to remind ourselves of. We all need to be critiqued. We all need to be constantly pruned. We need to be tapped on the shoulder, and that's why God's word is so important for that, because the noise outside the the noise on TV, in the news, in society, sometimes resounds so loudly, it starts, the reverberations start to have an effect within our churches and our families. That's why we have to fight to protect, in a sense, right, what God intends structure-wise for our church and families. And again, I'm reminding you, we're not talking about politics, which is, I think, is an you know, open season, gender-wise, right? I don't think the Bible refers to the fact that there's leadership necessary implied in that. We see a woman like, you know, Hulda and Deborah in particular that have a slightly, you know, perhaps political as well as spiritual role. So we recognize that. In businesses, right, in the New Testament, we see women. Lydia seems like she, was, she had her own business. There are women. You know, God doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with that. He's not doing anything with politics. He's not doing anything with businesses in the world. God is concerned about two things in his Bible. His spiritual community, which obviously in the Old Testament is shaped in different ways. There isn't really, right, the tent of meeting here, for example, that appears here. And then the temple appears later, as well as the church. But there's still this kind of spiritual essence that's taking place as God in each of these structures are the same. Family also. Family also plays out the same way through the Bible. And we're just asking the questions is God sending us a message by showing us these patterns over and over and over again? Or is it just, you know, happenstance? I seem, I seem to think that God understands our psychology. He knows that we learn best when lessons are repeated and constantly reminded. I think the Bible is a good example of that for his spiritual community and families. Anyone else before we move on? John? over his wife, I want to remind everybody that word rule in Hebrew can have various meanings. And if you'll look at the, the way it's used, especially in Genesis, Adam is also called to rule over creation, right? But when he rules, is he called to go out and cut down and destroy? No, you get, he nurtures, right? He cares for, he protects. So it, when that word rule is used in the essence of what God intended, which is John's point, women would have less reason, at the very least, to rebel against male leadership 
if it was being used appropriately. So you're holding us accountable, John, as men and people in leadership positions. We all know this. With great power comes what? Great responsibility. To him who has given much, much will be what? Required. So God has given, I believe, through his Bible, again, only in two places, in the church and his spiritual communities and the family. God has given the role of leadership to the man. But like John points out, one reason why women, we've had problems over the centuries with women rebelling is because some men have, unfortunately, taken that word rule to mean to beat down and to control. And if you look carefully in Genesis, how God intended for Adam to rule the world, it's done appropriately, much like Christ is called to rule the church. There's has no reason to fight back against that. In fact, when you see Christ dying on the cross, doesn't that say everything it needs to say that when he asks you to take up your cross and follow him, doesn't it make it a lot easier when you see the self-sacrifice of Christ in that regard? I think so, and your point's well taken, John. If men would take that self-sacrificial, protective, nurturing, caring part that God intended by that word to rule or to care for, uh, it would be a lot easier for women uh, to want to follow that lead. Thank you. All right. So I think we've covered this time period pretty good. We've spent several weeks, and to be honest now, several months over this, and I'm glad to say we're moving into the Christian era, which I'm really excited about. So get your Bibles open. Look at Matthew chapter 1. We're going to start there. Matthew chapter 1. Now, as you turn there, I want to ask this question. Is leadership a competition? Well, think about it. When coaches, football coaches, football season started Thursday night, right? But basically, it starts today. When football coaches and other sports choose a captain, isn't it usually based on who is the strongest guy in the weight room, who's always the best player on the field? Isn't it always decided that? Let me ask this. Do you think that Tom Brady at the age of 45 is the strongest guy? In the world? He's not. Do you think he's considered the leader of the Tamp Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Why is that? He's smart, he, but you see, he has a role, and he's been able to work outside of this, sometimes we think, dominant destructiveness that comes sometimes with leadership, because sometimes we can see leadership as someone who controls people, as John pointed out, with husbands doing that to their wives. But people follow leaders, not necessarily because of the strongest or the mightiest or the most abusive. But as you say, Greg, they show intelligence. They also show a sense of leadership and sense that people know that they care for them and that they want to follow that person's lead because they feel like they have the qualities that they appreciate and admire. So sure, you know, there are people a lot stronger than some captains on some teams. There are sometimes faster people. I mean, you have offensive and defensive linemen sometimes that are captains. Do you think they're the fastest guys on the team? Probably not, but they have attributes. So captain, coaches choose leaders and give them that role, usually not because they are the best players. Sometimes it comes hand in hand, but usually it's because they notice they have qualities that are intrinsic to leaders, that people go, I want to follow that guy or that lady. It's a lady sports team, right? So that's an important part. So I don't think, and I believe you would agree with me, that leadership necessary is a competition. Now, our world makes it play out that way a little bit. You watch the presidential elections. Would you say that's kind of a competition? It is. It's a very brutal one, isn't it? You hear the way some of those people talk, it's hard to believe the way they talk about each other, talk about family members, talk about, you know, the history of those. I mean, I don't know how, I almost don't know how you could be a Christian and run for president without getting your hands dirty. I really don't. I would, I would really admire someone, a Christian person that could step forward and somehow stay out of the mud and still be appreciated by others. But it seems like, right, that when you live in the world, you have a tendency to get dirty, right? You wrestle with pigs, what's going to happen? <laughs> right? You're going to get muddy. So we, again, this is a fight we have to continually remind ourselves that in the church, in the family, leadership is not about what happens like that outside the world. 
It's not based on the best looking, necessarily the smartest, necessarily the fastest or the wealthiest. There are other qualities intrinsic, and these are roles that God decides, and that God appoints according to what his will is on those occasions. And we've seen that play out in the New Testament, and now we're turning to the New Testament to see that. I'm going to read through a few names here. I don't want to bore you with the whole genealogy of Christ, which is what a large part of Genesis 1 is, but I want you to notice there are a few women's names mentioned within this genealogy. Let's just take a little look here and work through this, and let's see if we can pick up on something on this. So we've got Genesis chapter 1, as it says there in verse 1, this is the genealogy of Jesus. There we go, verse 2. I'm not going to read word for word, just kind of skimming through. You got Abraham, of course, which is where this genealogy starts. Verse 3, you get to who Rahab is. Now, there's a lady that had a great reputation, didn't she? <laughs> now, she later on had a great reputation, but if you take the Hebrew word at face value, what was her job at the time? She was a prostitute, right? She was a harlot, as the Bible in some ways say. And yet, the Bible mentions her here. Why? Why would you mention a woman who had that reputation at one time in the genealogy of Christ. What's that? All right, so Shari's reminding us that when the spies from God's people came to visit Jericho, she hid them. And from that point on, we kind of, it, it appears that she made a change in her life. I think we call it repentance. Now, the Bible doesn't say Rahab repented of her former lifestyle, but her actions certainly indicates she hid the spies, which means she put her life on the line, did she not? Yeah, the hide, the enemies, you know, spies that come in. And you remember what she says when those spies came there, and they're kind of like, you know, I'm paraphrasing here a little bit. Why are you doing this? And you remember what she said? I've heard about your God, what he did at the Red Sea. And you get the feeling that there was a history beginning with Rahab. Now, we don't know exactly what happened, but it feels like she was the only people living in Jericho that were spared, and she became a part of the community of God's people. And somehow she married somebody within that community that forgave her of her past life, and she ended up becoming a relative of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Is there a sermon in there somewhere, everybody? Again, why would you choose to mention in the genealogy of Jesus someone like this. You think God sent in a message? You think he appreciated Rahab? Would you, would you mention somebody you don't recognize and, and see the qualities? I mean, usually when you point to people in your family tree, yes, you want to be honest, but, you know, he didn't have to name the wife. He could have just named the husband, which is what happens mostly in this genealogy. It seems, again, God recognizes Rahab's value, not based on her former life, but the qualities that she began to show when she lived with this community of people. Jamie, did I see you twitching back there? Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, it's certainly because he's in his genealogy too, isn't he? Yeah. Yes, Rahab again is part of the family line of Christ. Let's keep working down through and see if we come across another woman. We got verse 5, we got Rahab, and then we've got another woman, don't we? What's her name, everybody? Here we are, Ruth. We remember her, don't we? She has a book in the Bible named after her. Was she a Jew, everybody? Isn't it interesting? The first two women who are non Jewish people. Yeah. God certainly has a sense, I don't want to say this irreverently, but it almost has a sense of humor. You know, it's like, before you people get too uppity about your biological heritage, let me point out a couple of things. People are not chosen just because, necessarily, they're from the right family, biologically speaking. Jason? She made that, she hid the spies. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
good point. Jesus is reminding us, you know, in the Faith Hall of Fame there in Hebrews, I believe it's 11, isn't it? Chapter 11, if I remember correctly. Rahab has mentioned she made that decision to hide the spies based on faith. And evidently, God is, in a sense, maybe pointing her out, not because of what her previous life was, but what she began to show as a faithful person who believed in God himself in the book of Hebrews, along with Ruth and Sarah and some other women there are also pointed out in a similar way. So very important point about that. So we got Ruth, of course. Uh, the story is a beautiful one there, and it's four chapters if you haven't read it before. But again, she's not a Jew, but she becomes an important part there. Um, let's work our way down. Hmm, verse 6. We don't have a woman's name, but she's described as what? The wife of Uriah, which is a reference to who, everybody? Uh -huh. David, thank you, David. You would know that, right, since your name is David. <laughs> uh, but uh, what was uh, Uriah's wife's name, everybody? Bathsheba, right? So you know how that played out. But again, God sends Solomon eventually through David and Bathsheba's line. All right, well, anyway, we keep working our way down, and we finally get down here a little bit further and look at verse 18. Right, we have Mary. We all know very well the mother of Jesus. John, thank you. We I did skip over her, didn't I? Thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, we have Tamar, who's also mentioned in this lineage. Her situation is a little more complicated, right? Uh, but uh, you know, she was promised. A, a husband, two of her husbands passed away, and she was promised a husband from the same family, and the father-in-law unfortunately didn't live up to that. Some complicated things there not to go in today and uh, get off track too much, but still God used that very complicated and, and messed up relationship to still show us that he can make beauty out of a mess that sometimes human beings make. So Tamar, thank you, is another one there. So we have, if I remember correctly, five women that are mentioned here in the genealogy of Christ, if you count Mary also the mother. What is God saying? Or what is he not saying? What's that? We have roles again. Does it sound like God appreciates women? There's not as many women mentioned as men, so that must mean God's misogynistic, right? Is that, is that what's being relayed to us? If you're honestly... After what we've studied in the Old Testament, and you, the first thing you come across is Matthew chapter 1, and you read that, would you honestly read that and go, why, is it, why aren't more women mentioned? Is that what goes through your mind? Come on, let me, let me hear from you. John? Good point. John's reminding us not, I mean, God could have named Sarah here, couldn't he have not have? He could have named Rebecca. He could have named Rachel. And certainly he loved and appreciated him. John's point is, of all the women that God could have mentioned, he's naming people like Tamar and Rahab. And even though Ruth was a good woman, she wasn't a Jew either. God could have made things or not upset the apple cart so much if he had named beautiful what society or Jewish people, at least at this time, would have considered beautiful, acceptable women. And he didn't do that. Again, what's the message? That's what I'm asking. It doesn't say it, but let's put on our thinking caps here. What is God communicating through the women that he does mention in the genealogy of Christ and the way that he shows the family line of Jesus coming into the world? All right. Okay, and again, this, this can vary. I'm sorry, we have to stop here. I've run over time, but just realized that, man, time goes fast in this class. I love that. We're going to pick up here next week, but just real quickly, on Narlin's point, Narlin wants to say to us, right, God can redeem anybody and anything that he so desires. That's another message here. God redeems people, period. And Rahab, Ruth, 
Others, there are examples of that. So again, we're going to see. I think there are more messages here. I hope you'll, we don't typically read over the genealogy of, and get too much into it. But just take time maybe once to read over it this weekend. Just after knowing what we've discussed in the past, next week come back and tell me what else is it that God is saying besides maybe one of the messages that Narnan sees here, which is redemption. Let's end with a word of prayer. Thank you for being with us today. Father, thank you for your word. May we continue to look into how you want your spiritual organizations and your families to work. And may we be appreciative of the roles that you've given us, honor those, and honor those around us. In your son's name we pray this. Amen. All right, I'll be back with you in about 12, 13 minutes for worship. Thank you, everybody.